Uh, oh. God. Okay. Close safe. Good morning. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Cliff Sargent, and I haven't showered. Okay. Uh, frantically trying to finish this book that keeps getting recommended to me. Loving it so far. Very excited to review it, but you know, it's a little bit of a, a longer one. So we'll get there. In the meantime, Paradise Lost by John Milton. Ah, fucking hail Satan. Here we go. John Milton was an English poet and man of letters who wrote one of the greatest English poems of blah de blah fucking blah Holy grail of religious fictional epic poetry uh, In blank verse, no less. Fancy term, huh? Unrhymed lines, an iambic pentameter. Thanks, Wikipedia. God, I'm such a cunt. So this was basically age 16 to 18 for me with like sod and black metal and clove cigarettes and this is a hell of a book because the most humane character with the best lines and monologues is not God, it's not Adam and Eve, it certainly isn't Michael the angel, it's Satan, the quintessential angel slave turned king of the damned. What you have here in the creation of Paradise Lost in the 1600s is not unlike that scene from Amadeus where Salieri is taking notes from Mozart while Mozart is dying in bed and they're writing like confutatis and uh, it's very frenetic and passionate. Basically, Milton at the time that he had actually sat down to write this thing, which took uh, years, it was like uh, six, five or six years or something like that. Uh, he was basically dictating this to like his three daughters, which is Nicely portrayed in this painting by Eugene Delacroix. He sold it to his publisher at the time for a whopping five fucking pounds. Or about 7,500 is the equivalent they say today. Somewhere around there. Uh, I think it was pounds. Um, it had a tremendous impact. Uh, his legacy is obvious. I don't, you know, I don't even need to say anything. Milton is one of... What is argued to be like certainly one of the greatest English poets and poets of all time. Moving forward in his legacy, Gustave Doré did some incredible, I think they were like woodblock carvings or I'm not sure if they were illustrations, but they're absolutely like astoundingly beautiful and you'll, you know, they're very, uh, very iconic, very recognizable. He did a bunch of those for the book and then William Blake also did some paintings for the book which were really astoundingly beautiful and um, William Blake actually considered himself to be Milton's poetical son. So later on, T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound were not so big on Milton and trying to get away from that. But I mean, it's sort of like being in a rock band and trying to escape the Beatles or Elvis. It's impossible, but it's probably good to try. Maybe. Whatever. I don't know shit about poetry. Essentially, the book is a fictional retelling of the uh, first chapter of the Old Testament, Genesis, the fall of man, and their expulsion from the Garden of Eden due to being tempted by the fallen angel, Satan. So you have two main parts of the story, and I think it's divided into something like 12 books. Uh, you have two main parts of the story. You have the fall of Lucifer, and then you have the trials of Adam and Eve. Meanwhile, you kind of like switch back and forth between heaven and the Garden of Eden. Um, guess which is the most interesting? Lucifer, the brightest and most beautiful of all the angels, does something that the others don't. He wants more. He's brash. He's arrogant. He's charismatic. He actually desires. He's competitive. He wants what we want. He wants freedom. Total freedom. So it's very easy to consider Lucifer the protagonist of this section, but he'll end up being something like the suffering tragic hero. He not only wants freedom, he wants dominion. Absolute sovereignty. And for three days, he and his army of angels wage war on God. But as you can guess, he's kind of fucked over by the Son of God and uh, chucked off the clouds into the black abyss. Down, down, as far down as the word down can mean. Into the hole, into the depths of Tartarus. Nine times the space that measures day and night they fall. Rot then. So now he sets to rebuilding his vision of his kingdom in hell and he decides with his committee that he will poison the most favored creation by God, which would be us, men. Hmm. So like Odysseus, he plunges into chaos outside of hell and goes and travels to the surface 
And uh, the unfortunate thing about this is that uh, God has that whole omnipresent ability, so he can totally see Satan swooping on his wings into the Garden of Eden. And basically, he says, oh, okay, Satan's up to some shit. And so the Son of God volunteers to go down and have like, kind of like a search party and be like, you know, hey. So Satan is 86th out of the Garden of Eden, but <laughs> he's got some tricks up his sleeve. The Prince of Darkness is far sneakier than that. So, he disguises himself as a serpent. You like that? Serpent. Whispering into Eve's ear to eat from the tree of knowledge. Eat the apple from the tree of knowledge. Eat of the fruit, which was the only thing that God commanded that Adam and Eve not do, under threat of death. Of course, Adam and Eve don't actually know what death is, having never seen it or experienced anything like it before, so there's... But anyway. So, Eve... Uh, trusting the snake, decides to eat the fruit, and Adam, seeing her, knows it's the wrong thing to do. However, he has this kind of, like, whole romantic thing. They're bound together by his bone. <clears throat> and, you know, if you die, I must die too. Oh man, how many times this shit has happened. So after they eat the fruit, mmm, delicious knowledge. They have dirty, lusty, freaky fruit sex. Then, that is followed by a whole bunch of guilt and shame. And they're like, oh no, Satan won, man, zero. So then they're cast out of the Garden of Eden in a very tragic moment in English poetry. And now they have disease, death, child support, day jobs, taxes, and government. Life is now terrible. And Michael, the angel, like God's little butt boy, uh, just adds insult to injury, being saying that by following God, they might be able to find a paradise within the happier fall. As if that's some sort of consolation. Don't give these people hope, you asshole. That's the last thing that they need. Such poor, bamboozled, nudist fucktards. But then I think God gets revenge by turning everybody back in the hellish kingdom into like a serpent. So they're all snakes. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've read it all the way through and it's a very long book. Definitely worth your time though. So if you can tell by now in my not-so-humble opinion, you don't read this thing for God or Michael or the angels or the like sickeningly floral descriptions of the Garden of Eden, which is... No, you read this shit for Satan. Easily the most relatable character of the entire book. It's nothing without him. Milton's wit and poetic gift are shining through in the monologues. Also, his political history, you know, with his passion for, uh, uh, you know, for politics and, uh, you know, freedom. Like back in the beginning and right after the fall when Satan is addressing the weary army of fallen angels in the pit of the abyss. Is this the region, this the soil, the climb, said then the lost archangel. This the seat that we must change for heaven, this mournful gloom for that celestial light. Be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right. Furthest from him is best, whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail, whores, hail, infernal world, and thou profoundest hell. Receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I be still the same, and what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater? Here at least we shall be free, the Almighty hath not built. Here for his envy will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice, to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. That shit just leaves me clapping like a retarded seal. <laughs> There's a lot more about this book. There's a lot of scholarly articles arguing about the religious ambiguity. <laughs> I'm not an academic. I'm going to die. So hopefully this has been a somewhat decent summary. It's kind of casual, but uh, hopefully it inspires you at least with with you know some of these things from Lucifer to uh, to tackle this whale of a poem. It's absolutely worth your time, and it's referenced all through 20th century li literature. It's all over the place. It's better than food. It's even better than God's delicious all knowy Eden apples. Remember the Gospel of John. If you go home with someone and they have a pet snake and they make you eat apples, punch them in the face and don't fuck them if they don't have books. All right, have a great day.